In 1904, American poet Carl Sandburg visited the Millville Glass Works. This is what he saw. Passing back and forth in the pale, weird light, these creatures are imps in both the modern and old-time sense of the word. They are grimy, wiry, scrawny, stunted specimens, and in cuss words and salacious talk, they know all that grown men know. Their education has consisted mainly of the thoughts, emotions, and experiences that resulted from contact with blowers and gaffers. Besides views of a big, barn-like space lit up by white-hot sand. This has been their universe at those times of day when they were most alive, most wide awake, most sensitive to impressions. God help them. Yes, I think, God help them. For their eyes remind me of shriveled pansies, and I can't resurrect pansies. I can only see that the pansies have good soil to grow in, pure water, fresh air, sunshine, stars, and dew. The words are Sandberg's, but the photos are by one of America's most important photographers, Louis Hine, who brought his investigative camera down to the glass factories of South Jersey in 1909 and captured images that can still haunt our conscience over a hundred years later. These are not today's children, the texting, smartphone-carrying children of our helicopter parents. These were children of a more difficult era. They were born when there was no law that said that you had to stay in school until the age of 16, and there was no law that said just because you were 10 years old, you couldn't work 60 hours a week. Our story started with those great hind photographs and the dramatic words of Sandberg. But those haunting pictures took us on a quest to find out what we could about the children, their work, and the world they lived in. President Taft sat in the White House, and while there was a big push for education, less than one half of America's students got out of the eighth grade. Baseball was king in the small towns, but Babe Ruth was only 14 years old. The fierce Apache Geronimo died peacefully on a reservation in Arizona that year, and Mark Twain, America's greatest living writer, died the next year. New Jersey was the capital of the film industry. Hollywood was just some scrub land outside Los Angeles. America was now 91 million strong and 30% were kids under the age of 15. There were 8 million new immigrants, over 2.5 million from Italy. The average life expectancy was 50 years for a white man, only 35 for a black man. $600 a year could support a family of four, and there was no income tax. Our carrying in kids made about $3 for a 60-hour week, or $150 for a year. But bread was seven cents, a dozen eggs you could get for 34 cents, and you could take an excursion from Philadelphia to the New Jersey shore for $1.50. Our boys in glass houses came to be there because that was where the work was. Glass was a booming industry in South Jersey in 1909. As Carl Sandberg pointed out, Down in southern Jersey they make glass. By day and by night the fires burn on in Millville and bid the sand let in the light. Millville by night would have delighted Whistler, who loved gloom and mist and wild shadows. Great rafts of wood and big brick hulks dotted with a myriad of lights, glowing and twinkling every shade of red big black flumes shooting out smoke and sparks. Bottles, bottles, bottles of every tint and hue, from a brilliant crimson to the dull green that marks the death of sand and the birth of glass. In the 1730s, old Caspar Wistar, a Philadelphia entrepreneur and friend of Ben Franklin, came down to South Jersey and recognized that this area had great natural resources to make glass. 
It had fine, clean sand and lots of wood for a very hot fire. Also available were oyster shells for lime, seagrass to pack the glass, and a good system of river transportation. So Wistar started the first successful glass factory in America in Alloway, New Jersey, and brought in glassmakers from Germany to run it. By the 1740s, they were producing 18,000 bottles a year and most of the window glass for the British colony. By the 1850s, nearly one-third of all the glass made in the United States came from 28 factories in South Jersey. Dr. Theodore Corson Wheaton was one of the most remarkable men in our story. A local boy from a colonial family, he was raised in Seaville, Cape May County, and early on he learned the value of hard work. Before he was 20 years old, he had worked on a farm as a railroad laborer and as a deckhand, and he had saved $1,000 for his education. He moved to Philadelphia where he studied medicine and pharmacy for four years. When he was finished, he married and moved to the bustling city of Millville in 1882, where he opened a medical practice in a pharmacy. It was then he took an interest in glass, and in 1888 he bought into a small glassworks to produce pharmaceutical and medical glassware. By 1891, he gave up his medical practice to run T.C. Wheaton Glassworks, and he went on to purchase 25 blocks of then unoccupied land in the northeast part of Millville so that he could expand his business. Aside from expanding his glass business, he opened two drug stores, a department store, and a general store where his employees received credit. This credit was especially useful to the workers because the glass factories often shut down in the summer because of the heat. Who were these boys and where did they come from? South Jersey native Ernie Casaccio remembers stories from his uncles who worked in the glass houses as young boys. My grandparents came over from Italy as immigrants and they purchased a 17-acre farm. Uh, they had nine children. Uh, my grandfather passed away at an early age and in order to pay bills and make ends meet, uh, my grandmother, two sons, Rocco and Nick, went to the glass house, which would be the Newfield Glass House, to work as pulling out boys. Uh, the job that was dirty and nasty entailed taking gobs of glass out of the furnace, running the gobs of glass to the glass blowers, and then returning the remnants to the furnace and part of the process of making glass. To bolster his case against child labor, Lewis Hine identified as many of the young boys as he could. When he photographed George Cartwright, George was 13 and looking for work although he had worked off and on for two years already. His dad was a glass grinder and his older brother Charlie was a dresser. Harry Simpkins was 16 when this picture was taken, but he had started in the mills at age 12 and used to walk to work with his brother Samuel and his father, who was a glass blower. Harry was one of eight children and two of his sisters worked in a clothing factory nearby. The family came on difficult times when his youngest sister died in 1910 and his dad died in 1912. Newspapers across the country reported a darker side of the business which involved boys being taken from orphanages and poorhouses by men and women who claimed to be their guardians but would make up false papers showing that the children were 14 and then live off of their wages. Howard Sheldon Lee was born in 1893 in Millville, the son of William B. Lee, who was a carpenter at a mill. When he was photographed, he was one of eight siblings with two sisters also working nearby. People would later look back on these pre-war days as the good old days. But factories and workplaces were much less regulated and therefore much more dangerous in this time period. In 1907 at the Monaga Mines in Pennsylvania, an explosion killed over 350 adults and children. In 1911 at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City, 146 young women burned to death, many trapped behind chain doors. Smaller accidents were not uncommon. 
To quote from some local newspapers, a young lad by the name of Batterson had an eye burned out with a hot glass tube on Monday. It is thought that the unfortunate lad will not survive. Cape May County Gazette. Benny Simpkins was grinding one of the bottles Tuesday when the bottle burst, mutilating his hand in a terrible manner. Camden Daily Post. John Simons, a young man employed in Tillier Brothers Glassworks in Vineland, was frightfully cut and burned about the arms yesterday by the breaking of a glass cylinder. Camden Daily Telegram. Martin Lolo is slowly recovering from the effects of being painfully burned by accidentally dropping molten glass into his shoe while working at the factory a few days ago. West Jersey Press. Millville had its own tragedy in April of 1907. The Bridgeton newspaper reported that seven young women had been working in the grinding room, laughing and chatting, when a strong wind blew over a towering smokestack which crashed into the building, killing three of the girls. Buried under tons of brick were Lydia Thurston, 18, Lena Doughty, age 16, and Sylvia Gallagher, age 17. The girls were well known and well respected, and the tragedy so unnerved the workers that every department in the large plant was shut down for the day. Eventually, the parents sued, and each parent got $1,500, about what the girls would have earned if they had lived to the age of 21. The debate over child labor was waged with fierce energy by the progressives of the era, including Sandberg, Upton Sinclair, and South Jersey's own remarkable Ella Reeve Bloor. I remember being at a women's suffrage convention in Pennsylvania. A woman shared a common sentiment. She said the kids were better off in the mills. If they were on the streets, they'd just be getting in trouble. Better the mill? Well, let me tell you, I set those women straight. I've been to the mill. I saw what I saw. Most of the boys I saw were 10 or 12 years old. It was their job to hold a bottle on the end of a long pole in a blazing hot furnace for a certain length of time and then hand it to the blowers. The heat was intense, but they dared not move the bottle a hair's breadth. It was terrible work for children. I have seen those photos by that socialist organization. I want to point out one very true fact. That Heinfeld, he lied to get onto our grounds. What is the good of an organization that starts out with a lie? How much of what he says is true? He told Mr. Grayson that he was a postcard salesman, and then he tries to make us look bad. Some of the photos do look bad, but I want to tell you the honest truth of the matter. Those boys might look rough around the edges. But they are very good boys, and they are better off working in my mill than out on the streets. In here, they are working with their fathers and good Christian men who are teaching them the benefits of hard work. Ella Reed Bloor grew up in Bridgeton in the 1870s, a daughter in a wealthy family. She was educated at the exclusive Ivy Hall Seminary, but after finishing her schooling at age 14, she was radicalized and was questioning why her family should live in a nice house on the top of the hill, while the poor lived in squalid conditions down below. Ella left to get married, but when she returned to South Jersey in the early 1900s, she had already been married twice, had six children, as well as extensive experience fighting for the rights of women and the poor workers from Maine to Colorado. When I came back, it was with Upton Sinclair. We had worked together in Chicago. He wanted to see if the owners were obeying the law about children not working at night. I posed as a stepmom with three kids. Those bosses were very happy to see me, promised me a company house and plenty of day and night work for my boys. I had one close call in the courtyard of a factory the president of the company was there and I had to duck my head. He was a friend of my father's and knew me growing up. In my opinion, the capitalist class shoots down mothers and children. It stops at nothing, no matter how monstrous, to stop the organization of workers. And that annoying state legislature up in Trenton, what are they doing meddling in things that don't need to be fixed? They want no night work, but let me tell you something. They set up there and they know nothing of making a product or meeting a payroll. I have over 1,000 men and women on my payroll 
and that is a fierce responsibility. No night work? They want no night work for these boys? They have no idea what they're talking about. Do you have any idea what it takes to raise a furnace to 3,000 degrees? You can't just turn a switch off and shut it down for the night. We make glass. We make glass for America, and that is serious work. Run one shift a day, and we would be out of work in a month. What nonsense. Besides, we run a night school here, just as good as the public school, and we make those boys go to 60 sessions a year. Put those boys out of work, and they will be out on the streets. I know about those schools. I was helping in one nearly 25 years ago, and I can tell you, those boys were too tired from work to keep their eyes open. Schools, bah. Those schools were a joke. Just a sop to appease the politicians. They are learning a skill that will last them a lifetime. Most of these children have finished school anyway. What would they be doing? Hanging on the sidewalks of this town? I'll tell you, they would be learning to curse and swear and smoke and gamble the few pennies they have. I'll tell you where they would be. They'd be on the road to perdition. If they are smart and hardworking, they will learn a skill that will keep them well paid for life. Listen to that high and the muckrakers and we'll all be out of work. It might be nice to think that the crusade against child labor ended with the work of Hein and Bloor and the others, but it didn't happen that way. Many parents and bosses wanted the kids to work, and I imagine many of the kids themselves would choose work over school. They may not have liked the working conditions, but low pay was better than no pay, and to be able to bring pay home made them feel grown up. In 1915, the first automatic bottling machine was invented and was able to produce as many bottles in a single day as a hard-working team could produce in a week. The industry continued to grow and change in the 20th century, and South Jersey stayed a center of the glass industry, particularly in specialty glass. And the kids remained in the glass industry into the 1930s. The laws that Hine and Bloor fought for finally came into effect during the Depression when there were too many grown men out of work for the glass industry to employ boys. What happened to our people? Louis Hine went on to continue his work as a professional photographer over in Europe during the First World War, and then recorded the building of the Empire State Building in 1929. However, his style of work fell into decline, and he found it harder and harder to find paid work. He died penniless in 1940. Carl Sandburg, the poet of the people, went on to win three Pulitzer Prizes for his poetry and his monumental biography of Abraham Lincoln. One of his last public appearances was to read a poem at the Kennedy inauguration in 1960. He died in 1967. Ella Reeve Bloor continued her fight for justice for the rest of her life, participating in strikes from the mines of Colorado to the mills of Maine. She was there at the start of the American Communist Party, and as a party member visited Russia in the 1930s. In 1940, she wrote her autobiography, We Are Many, and lived until 1951 and was known with affection as Mother Bloor. T.C. Wheaton made a successful transition to mechanized glass blowing and saw his business expand through World War I and into the 1920s. He continued his community work and at different times served on the Millville Board of Health and the Board of Education. For many years, he was a councilman for the Fourth Ward. In 1924, Dr. Wheaton donated an entire city block of land for the new high school. He died in 1931 leaving behind a vibrant business to his son, Frank. Howard Sheldon Lee served in World War I as a corporal, Company B, 331st Infantry. After the war, he was a self-employed plumber and married later in life to Alma Jenkins in 1940. He died in 1943 and is buried in Mount Pleasant Cemetery, Millville.
George Cartwright. By 1917, his parents were dead and all but one of his siblings. During the war, he was a private in the Army. When he got out, he moved to the Zern County in Pennsylvania and married Omira Mosseran. Through the years, he is listed as a coal loader and a sawmill hand. When he died in 1960, he left behind six boys and six girls. Harry Simpkins. Harry lost his sisters, Alice, age 17, and Marie, 21, to the Spanish flu in 1918. He stayed around Bridgeton and helped his mom with a pool hall, and in the 1930 census, he was working in a machine shop with his brother. He never married and lived his entire life in Bridgeton. He died in 1946 at the age of 53.